There we go. Thank you, Carrie. My my amazing sister is on the webinar. Um, she's actually the reason why we're doing this webinar tonight because she asked me, oh gosh, like two weeks ago, she, she was talking about uh, kind of some overwhelm at work, how much stuff she has to do. And I was telling her about ChatGPT and that she could use it at work. And so I took that and used it to make some webinars. And so tonight um, we're going to be walking through, sorry, I got to clean off my my camera here, um, how to use ChatGPT at work. Um, I know some of you may struggle with this as far as the concept of it, and it may be a little bit offensive. And so as we jump in here, um, I would just say open your mind up. And, and there's a couple things up front that I'm going to kind of nail down from a just just from a mentality standpoint, how to think about um, AI and AI writing and that kind of stuff, because I believe most people who are struggling with it right now, um, it's a, a mental thing of it's replacing us, right? That, that this is taking our place. It's taking the place of humans. It's going to replace our jobs. Um, secondly, I think when um, most people go into use chat GPT or use an AI writer like this, um, they just jump right in and ask it to do work for them. And so, um, and then it comes back kind of vague. And so today I'm going to unpack my approach to use it. Um, many of you probably are invited here either because uh, you follow Ryan Kohler or Ryan K on LinkedIn or via email. Um, and so we're going to jump right in. I'm just going to fire up my screen share here. Don't worry if you miss any of this or if you have to bail off or anything like that. Um, it is recorded. I will send out an email with the link to it. And so we'll be able to um, now as I you'll be able to watch it later. So as we get going here, I just like to hear like, what is your number one question? If there's one thing that you saw this this email that I sent out, you saw me post on social media, you came to the session about AI and how to find work-life balance. And so I'm just curious as we get started, maybe go over to the chat and tell me what's what's your big question? What's the one thing that you decided to come and hang out with me on a Sunday night at nine o'clock? Uh, it could be even later. Uh, I know somebody's here from Missouri, so I'm guessing it's like 10 o'clock there. So I'd love to hear it, throw it in the chat. Um, but I'm going to fire up my screen share really quick here, and uh, we're going to get going. All righty, so I've got the chat live so that if you guys chat, I can see it as we're going. Um, I have a little presentation. We're going to walk through a little bit of this deck, um, and then we're going to actually jump, and I'll show you how I actually use ChatGBT. Um, don't know exactly how it works. Excellent, Kathy. Um, yeah, like I think if... You must, you'd have to be living under a rock if you haven't heard of ChatGPT at this point. Um, most of it, we hear about it on the news because of kids using it to cheat in school. Um, now, if I'm being honest, um, actually, my son, who's 15, is was the first person who told me about ChatGPT. I picked him up from school one day. Um, I'd kind of been, I'd seen Jasper. I'd seen some of the earlier uh, AI writers, but he was telling me about um, chat GPT that they've been playing around with it in his programming class, wanted to know if I'd seen it, um, came home. My, my fiance was talking about it a little bit. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to jump in and go play around with this and see exactly what it is and how it works. And, and I would say that's the number one first rule of technology. So if you don't know very much about me, I, I went to college and became an accountant, uh, got an MBA, got a job as an accountant for a tech company. This was 20 years ago and I quit my job and started doing web marketing. Um, over the last, gosh, 18 years, I've started three different companies, grown and scaled them to uh, 10 years in a row on the Inc. 5000 list. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but this is our first warning of this. And, and this is, hopefully Kim doesn't come to this call, but um, this right here is the knee-jerk reaction if you're a writer or somebody like that. I will never use it. It's fraud. It's cheating. Now, this is our very first thing that we have to separate. I want you to separate school from work because while we might think that school prepared us to work, it actually didn't. You know, in school, we were taught to memorize things. At school, we were taught that we needed to create our own content from scratch, that it was our thought and our, our knowledge that went into a book report, all those kind of things, which it was. But when you cross the, the chasm over into the corporate world, those things are not still true. And so I just want you to think about a lot of people believe that AI is cheating or it's fraud or something like that because they're thinking about school. If a teacher gives you an assignment and says, start from scratch, 
use your own words, write a book report. Well, clearly using AI would be cheating. But in the business world, nobody's ever, ever said that. In fact, most lawyers don't start from scratch when writing an agreement. They grab their template and make adjustments. Most HR people don't start from scratch when they're writing a job ad. They go find one of their, their competitors' ads. They copy and paste it. I guarantee if you've used Excel or Word or anything like that, you've used a template. You have borrowed somebody's starting point and adjusted it. Now, the question is, do you feel like you're cheating when you do that, right? If you go and grab something like that, um, what can AI do for fiction writers? I'll, I'll kind of show you how I go about using it, Jim. Um, you can use it however you want, um, but I use it mostly for nonfiction because I use it for writing books and content and blog posts and email. In fact, if you read the email that I sent you um, to come here, uh, that was created by ChatGPT. It was written by ChatGPT. But I'm going to show you, I don't just go in and use it and say, write this for me. And I'll explain why in a minute. And that's one of the big, big misconceptions. But this right here, that I'll never use it um, and I'm going to somehow fight it. So let's just get one thing really clear up front. Any technology and its use in society or in business is not a democratic vote. You can't like pick it and get your port, your pitchforks and torches and call your congressman and tell them not to embrace technology. The same feelings were happening during the internet, when the internet first came out, when email first came out, all those kind of things, when an ATM machine came out. So just understand the first part, the like, you're not gonna stop this evolution. I was just reading an article five minutes ago. They are talking about South Korea and the article was saying South Korea was trying to change back to a 69 hour work week. I guess about three years ago, they dropped it down to 52 hours. That's 40 hours of full-time work plus 12 hours of overtime. And because they have a shortage of people, a shortage of labor, a shortage of talent, the government's saying maybe we should move this back up because we need our people to work longer hours. This is the funny thing about it. We actually have a talent shortage in the U.S. We have a talent shortage in a lot of those areas, in, especially in office workers and that kind of stuff. Just like South Korea has, the solution to it will most likely be AI. It will be using AI as an assistant. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is the actual talent gap in the United States right now. If you look at, you can see where COVID happened. Um, the red line is the unemployed, the number of unemployed people. The blue line is the number of job openings. This is zoomed out macro level for the entire United States. Before the pandemic, I my background is I build hiring software. I spent the last 17 years building a hiring software company, bootstrapped to 280 employees, mostly working moms. There's a reason why I target working moms with this type of a webinar. And it's because, well, to be honest, somebody needs to tell them what the secret weapon is they can use to find balance in their life. But I have a bunch of working moms who work for me, and I've been helping them use ChatGPT and AI to do their job better over the last few months, not because I want to work them harder, but because I want them, as long as they get the same stuff done, I want their life to be easier. But this is the real big problem here. We had a talent shortage before COVID, and today it's twice as bad as it was before. Most of the employers that I work with say they struggle to find qualified talent for their jobs. And unless we're going to hurry really fast and make some more workers, we need to find a way to make our workers more efficient, more effective at their job, faster and better at the same time. And so that's really what this is all about. Some employers are literally giving up on hiring. Some employers are, are just have this negative out uh, opinion that people these days don't want to work. Employers are trying to pull people back into the offices. They're trying to get you to come back into the office work because I don't know, they don't trust you to work from home. My team all works from home. And to be honest, I don't care if they're using AI to do their jobs as long as they do their job well. And just want, want to make sure now your boss may not say that to you. And so one of the things as we go through this, this webinar today, we're just going to train you on how to use it. My suggestion, embrace it and go get your feet wet. Go play around with it. What's the worst case that could happen, right? Like literally at the very least, if you decide that you're not going to use it, you'll know what it is and what it, how it works. And that right there, that understanding context 
is probably what makes us tech guys a little bit different than everybody else. We go play with new stuff, right? I was probably one of the first people that I knew running autopilot and a Tesla. I still have people um, complain online about Tesla, even though they've never even been in one. There's a lot of people who have an opinion about chat GPT or about AI writers and that kind of stuff who've never actually used it or haven't used it enough to actually know how it works. And so that's our first goal today. Instead of waiting for your boss to say, hey, can't you use this tool? Embrace it on your own. It's free. The paid account, which I would suggest is like 20 bucks a month. This is very, very, very low money. It's not, I mean, that's what, three Starbucks? For three Starbucks a month, you could have a tool and have the higher level version of it like what I would use. So, um, but just so you know, this isn't, I'm, a, I'm now working full-time at Refer. I have maybe... 12 employees there. We help job seekers find jobs. We help job seekers do better at their jobs. The goal of this is not to sell you anything. We don't charge our job seekers money. We make our money off of advertising. And so while it might seem weird that I would fire up and spend a Sunday evening just helping people for free, that literally is my goal. I, I just want to show you how this works, let you see exactly how I would set it up um, so that this week you could go and use it and make your life better. Um, make work better, make work easier. And so at Applicant Pro, one of the things I focused on was how to grow my own talent. And when you think about it, if you're a big giant company, you have all the money. And when you know Google and Facebook and those guys, they can buy their talent. They buy it by paying the most, having the best, the best benefits, et cetera. But as a small business or a bootstrap business, we only have two options. We either can hope that we find, you know, some of those table scraps that don't go to the big companies, or we can learn how to grow our own talent. And by growing our own talent, I mean, hiring, you know, raw talent. For me, it was a lot of part-time working moms that I hired and then trained and provided them with the tools and the knowledge and the ability to mentorship, to grow into their job, to become very effective at what they're doing, more effective than what I would have gotten if I would have hired all those, you know, Ivy League guys that, that everybody else was hiring. But I, that's, that's my specialty is growing my own talent. The problem is most employers don't view it that way. And so if you're waiting for somebody like me to come along and say, hey, I want to grow you into who you can become. I want to provide you the tools and techniques and knowledge. The simple fact is most employers aren't going to, which means you need to take it upon yourself to learn how to be better at not just your job for your employer, but to perfect your craft, to get better and better at doing what it is you do that you get paid for on your own. And so that's kind of what I'm dedicated to. And so if you need any help, more than happy to help you with it. But here's what I can tell you over the past, gosh, over the past 15 years, the number one thing that I've spent most of my time on is content. And when I say content, I mean blog posts, emails, webinars, uh, responding to somebody, uh, whether it's verbal and I'm talking or whether it's written or whatever the case may be, it is content. Um, most of uh, my leads come from either me speaking, me doing email marketing or web marketing of some type. And that means a whole lot of written conversation. What people don't know is I was, I'm not a writer. Uh, in fact, I can barely spell. My second grade mom, bless her heart, doesn't want to hear that. Um, but I, I can't spell super well. I don't have great handwriting. And it takes me a long time if I sit down and try to type out a blog post. I'm a really good speaker, though. I can riff and speak whatever I want to write. So about 10 years ago, when we started creating a lot of content at my company, I, I didn't want to type anymore. It was choking us. And so instead, we just started creating video recordings. I would, I would write a quick outline. I would record it from a video camera or I'd use audio to record it and I'd transcribe it into text by having somebody listen to it and type it out. It was a lot faster for me to have my assistant type my words into text and then clean it up for an email campaign or a blog post than it was for me to type them. I could spend 10 minutes riffing out a blog post and my assistant could spend an hour transcribing it, cleaning it up and making it look all perfect. And that was the best use of my time and the best use of my assistant's time. In fact, I think, she, I know Shayla, one of my employees that actually signed up to, to come to this call, she spent a ton of time with my recordings where, where I was sending her either an audio clip or a video clip 
to get something written out because that was the fastest way for me to disseminate that information. If I was talking to my employees, I would use Vidyard. I would make a recording and send them the video recording of it. It was just faster for me to be able to do this stuff. And so as we start thinking about this part of quality content is extremely important to me, you're going to go through some training today. I'm going to show you how I use ChatGPT personally. Just understand, most likely, if you go listen to anybody else, they're going to tell you, here's some prompts, go and use it. They're not going to push you um, as far into making sure that the content is king, that is great. But for me, I'm not just looking to use AI to make me faster. It has to be good. It has to be human-like. It has to sound like I wrote it. It needs to sound like me. And so I'm going to show you the framework that I use to do that. Um, but I want to be able to show you that there is a system or a process that you can go through to become much faster at producing just as good a content or just as good of email or anything like that that you've done before. Only you can get it done a lot faster. And to be honest, I don't know that I'd tell my boss. Um, if I was you, I would probably keep it a secret for a little bit. But this is what our goal is. Our goal is to get all four of these things at the same time. We want to be better, faster, cheaper, and easier. What do I mean by that? I don't just want it to be faster. If I optimize for speed, ChatGPT can crank a ton of content out really fast. The problem is it won't be very accurate. It'll be vague. That's what you hear most people say. Oh, I read this. It keeps repeating itself. It sounds like a robot. You know, it doesn't sound human. It doesn't sound like me. That's not because... Um, ChatGPT can't sound human. It's because they didn't take the time to train it just like a normal employee. Just think about it. If, if you have anybody who reports to you or you've ever trained an employee, imagine if I hired a brand new employee, they came to work tomorrow and all I did was walk in and say, hey, dear brand new employee who's never worked here before, this is your first day of work. I want you to write me a blog post about how hiring software um, will help small businesses find the people they need. Go. Now, I might hire a great writer and, and they might come up with a great piece of content, but there's a good chance that what the content says is not going to match what is in my brain because I didn't actually give them any context. I asked them something without giving them a backstory. I assumed that they would just figure it out. And so clearly that employee could have gone and spent days and they could have Google searched, they could have researched, they could have read a whole bunch of stuff and they could have come back with a great article, but it might've sounded like my competitors. It might've not been what my software was all about. And it all would have been my fault because I didn't provide context. When we ask a question of somebody without giving them context, then we're assuming that they are just reading our mind. And we're assuming that when they come back with an answer that we don't like, that it's their fault. But in actuality, when we don't provide context, then our quality is going to go down. So these top two, faster and better. I expect that when I'm using a, an employee, when I'm using a tool, when I'm using ChatGPT or AI, I need both of those. I don't want it to just be faster. It also has to be just as good. I'm not willing to sacrifice the quality of my content just to be faster. That's the bar that I set. And so as you're going through and watching this train tonight, just keep that in mind. Now, cheaper and easier means, is it faster for me? It takes less time. And easier means, does it get done in fewer days? Can I make the turnaround faster? This is really, really important. When you're trying to get something done, if you're a procrastinator or if you're just overworked, it isn't just about getting it done in fewer number of hours. It also means getting it done in fewer days. Those are two different measurements. It's how much back and forth you got to get. So I'm going to walk through the process. It's seven steps. Um, most of, if you've seen ChatGPT or have heard about it, most people are starting at step five, a prompt. If you get online, there's somebody out there who's like, hey, for a hundred bucks, you can download all my favorite prompts. You can download my sales prompts. You can download my marketing prompts. And I have no problem with you going and downloading those. But just understand that if your very first thing in ChatGBT is to simply type in a prompt that you got from somebody, you didn't provide it any context. Just think about that. You're starting at step five and judging its response after you skipped 
all of the backstory about what you want it to do, who you are, how it's kind of interesting, but I don't know why we think AI would know how, what our tone of voice is and how we talk and how we do things and what our backstory is and the vocabulary that we use individually. You see, when somebody uses AI and the words come back and they say, this sounds like a robot wrote it, what they're really saying is it doesn't sound like me. It doesn't sound like you know, my cadence and my vocabulary and the way I talk and the way I do things, it doesn't sound like me. Well, clearly it doesn't because it doesn't know you. And so this top part here, these four steps, I'm going to walk through the steps and then we'll actually jump into chat GPT. But these are by far the most important part, just like they're the most important part when talking to a human. And that's really the goal here. When you think about chat GPT, I want you to think about it like it's just your assistant. This is just, I've had tons of assistants over the years, some good, some bad. Um, I, I think of it just like it's my assistant. It's just my writing buddy. Me and this writing buddy are going to go back and forth and work on things. I'm going to treat it like it's human. And if, if you conceptualize it and talk to it that way, it, it will get you, um, your brain kind of tuned in the right way. I'm going to ask it, hey, I need you to help me write this thing. Here's the backstory. Here's what's going on. And so as we look at these first four parts, the story is the backstory. Hi, my name's Ryan. I work for Applicant Pro. I'm the CEO. That's that's part of the story, right? I, I, I Applicant Pro is X, Y, and Z. It's this type of a company. Now, number two is the target. Anytime you're writing something, whether it's a book or a blog post or just a response to an email, I, it has a target. It's going to somebody. So you see, right off, the, right off the bat, we've just changed and, and reverted back to normal human communication. I am this person, and I'm writing to this person. Whether that's a whole group of people, I'm, I'm Ryan, and I'm writing to accounting firm owners, or I'm writing to HR people, or whether it's, hi, I'm Ryan, I'm responding to my boss, uh, or anything like that, that is the way that you have to look and think about this piece. If you don't tell it who you are and you don't tell it who you're writing to, you're just assuming it will guess correctly. And it might sometimes guess correctly and it might sometimes guess wrong, but I don't know why you wouldn't just do it right the first time. Number three is the goal. What are you trying to accomplish, right? What is it that you're trying to do? So for instance, if my goal was to write an email to somebody in response to an email that I had sent them, then I would need to tell it who I was, what I did, who it was I was emailing, and what the goal was. Hey, the goal is to tell this person, no, I can't make it on Thursday. I need to tell it the goal. Now, the final one, four, is context. I need to feed it more information. That could be, for instance, if my boss wrote me an email and I wanted to have it help me reply, I would literally copy and paste that email into ChatGBT and say, write a response to this email. You see, without those three, those four parts, if you just give it a prompt, then it's going to give you back random information. Now, the next part is editing. And what I mean by that is, you don't just take it and copy and paste it out. If, if you want to massage it and evolve it, don't take it and massage it and evolve it on your own. Leave it in ChatGPT to make those changes. The reason is, is because then the next request you make from it, it will have gotten smarter. And it's not like, don't think about it like, again, I think most people struggle with AI right now because it's hurting their head. We're thinking about the matrix. We're thinking that it's going to take us over some crazy movie where AI, you know, either we fall in love with it or it takes over the world and decides to kill us all. Don't think about it like that. Think about it like this is just a conversation thread you're having with an employee. It's just a thread of a conversation conversation, only this employee looks back and reads through that conversation along with a bunch of the internet every time that you ask it to go back. And so that right there, so I'm going to jump over and I'll actually show you what this looks like in real time. I'm going to introduce you to a couple different tools. One of them is called otter.ai. Uh, this is otter right here. This is what I use. It's actually on my phone. So I have otter on my phone right here. I use this to transcribe audio to text. I'll show you how I use this in a minute here um, because Otter basically just takes while we're talking and transcribes it to text. Is it perfect? Nope, it's really not that great. It's good enough though. And I'll show you how I use it in connection with ChatGBT. 
The other thing that we have here is ChatGPT, right? And there's a couple different versions of it right now. Um, ChatGPT4 just came out. If you use it, you can only run 25 messages every three hours. It's not very much. And so it is better, but ChatGPT 3.5 is good as well. So that's our second tool. Our third tool is I use this web chat GPT extension. Um, it's a Chrome extension. So I'm running chat GPT in, uh, in Google Chrome with this extension. I'll show you what it does for me. If I just run um, a, a normal query of write a um, article about Russia, Russia invading Ukraine, right? I know that I probably shouldn't be starting with a topic like that, but whatever. So if you look at this and I ask it that question, the problem is that it doesn't have newer information in it. So if I'm trying to write something about recent events or recent information, the last three years are a little bit of a dark, a black hole for it. I would want to do something else. So if I want to write about, let's get into something less political. And I said, you know, how will AI change the work? I could ask it this question and it will give me back some response. So Jim, this is a great one. AI can't be as smart as you in your special area, but editing its content is how you correct for that. Yes and no, editing, but more importantly, feeding it the context you want. You see, what most people do with AI is what I just did here. You know, how will AI change? Let's write an article. And so we think, hey, let's just jump in and say, let's write an article about how it will impact human resources managers next year. Yeah, if, if I was just using it in this way and I allow it to start running on its own, I haven't given it any backstory, any context, any anything at this point. I'm just letting it rely on its own words. I'm not telling it what tone to use or anything like that. And so if I go back, back to, to my little outline here and I say, look, the prompt, the prompt is the request, okay? So the prompt is the request and I started on step five. Once again, I've gone past all of these other things. So instead, if I come back over here and say, well, no, I don't want to do it that way. I actually want to feed it information. This is where I can actually go and feed it some information. Let me see if I can find one of these that I wrote. Um, so I'm going to find some content that I've written. And if I come all the way up here to the top, you'll see, and, and the reason why I'm using this one is this shows an example of me feeding it information, right? So we start off, can you help me write a series of content to teach human resource professionals? So I started with who my target is and anyone else filling that role about recruitment marketing and better way to attract people to hire called the talent engine. You see this right here is my words. This is my terminology, okay? And so I went ahead and I said, hey, can you help me write this series of content? And it came back with blah, 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 what it gave back. But that's not what I actually wanted it to base it on. And so I went ahead and copied and pasted, this is my backstory. I'm Ryan Kohler. I'm the founder of Applicant Pro and Refer.io. I'm a recruitment marketing guru. Um, my tone is witty, irreverent, yet engaging and compelling. This is for, here's the reader. My content is written for disruptive human resource professionals who are looking for a different way to approach talent acquisition. Then I come down, here's my subject. Here's my subject about hiring's hard and it has negative impact. I call it the talent engine. Um, I actually plug in, this is my framework. So this attraction funnel is stuff that I came up with. You see, I'm feeding it my backstory. What will they need? What type of systems will they be successful? What are the results? So I actually feed it this every single time based on the story. And I have all these conversations over here. So if I wanted to talk to somebody about ERC tax credits, or if I wanted to talk to somebody about being a bookkeeper, I would switch over to that conversation. So if I was you, here's the, the quick hack. Your chat GBT should have a list of chats here based off of the subject matter that you, that you write on 
and or who you write to. So if I was just a normal office admin and I had marketing and accounting and bookkeeping, and I also had like, I write emails to our customers and I write emails to our employees and I write emails to my boss, I might end up with all seven of those as conversations over here. Think of it like it's just a chat on a given subject. So for me, I'm going to feed it this information. Now, how do I go about doing this? Well, you could go and type it up if you wanted. That is an option. Clearly, I don't. Instead, I simply grab Otter and I record the meeting that I'm having. And so here's Otter right here. And it's going through and it's it's grabbing all the information I'm saying. So if I if my boss came to me and said, hey, I need you to go and write a memo. I need you to go and write a blog post about something. I would say, hang on a second. And I'd turn on Otter. I'd say, let me record this so that it can be transcribed. So I'll have perfect notes about what we talked about. Then guess what I would ask him? Well, I would come up to the top and I would start with, okay, so who's this coming from? Am I writing it or is it from you, the CEO or whoever? Cool. Well, I can go and grab information about that person. I know what their tone is, but I could go and copy and paste the About Us page from our website. I could go and copy and paste my boss's LinkedIn profile right into here. That's my who am I? Now I go, okay, so who are we writing this to? Tell me about them. What, what is their challenge? What do we refer them to as? You know, we're writing this to our customers. Cool, but but not all customers are the same. So is there a certain segment of our customers? Is it a certain niche of our customers? Is it customers or is it prospects? Ask your boss these questions or ask whoever it is you're working with these questions. Awesome. Tell me about the subject. What is it that they're struggling with? What is it that we're trying to help them do? What is our goal of whatever it is we're about ready to write? And so the more you give it this information, now you see it's going away. As we, so I'm going to stop this. I'm going to jump over into Otter, and Otter is now going to come up with my conversation right here. And so I should, it's processing, it might take a minute. And so this is the information that we are just recording, right? Um, and so I could just go ahead and copy this into ChatGBT, and I could say, can you summarize this text? And so it's going to summarize it for me. It, it will type it so I can clean it up and save it in a Word doc or whatever as the backstory for when I'm writing about whatever. By feeding it that backstory, I'm going to jump back over to AI impact on office admins. No, it was talent attraction funnel. Here we go. So again, by feeding it my backstory, before I start expecting it to give me something, I'm able to start to train it on my words and my terminology. That's what I want to do. Great, here it's now it's going to respond. Great, with that context in mind. You see, now it's gonna talk about recruitment marketing because I fed it that word. It's going to talk about talent attraction funnel. It's going to talk about the talent engine. All of these things are my words. Now it's filling, it's filling in a lot of blanks from the overall internet, but I fed it certain information so that when I come down here, and say, hey, why don't you just help me write a book, come up with five irreverent and catchy book titles for a book written for HR people about building a talent attraction funnel. It's going to spit out some good book titles. You can see in here that there's words from what I was coming up with before. If I had just said, come up with five book titles for uh, about recruiting, it never would have used the word attraction or attraction funnel or anything like that, it wouldn't use this cloning concept because if you look up here in my content, you'll see it use this, who do we want to clone? I use the concept of cloning a hire by saying, I go into my office and I say, who do I want to hire more of? And I go and focus on them and figure out what makes them tick. That's how I talk about hiring. I use those words. Therefore now, ChatGBT is using those words because I gave it that context. Without that context, it would never talk like this. And so this is our very first concept that we have to get straight in our head. We need to train it on who we are, what kind of tone we use, how we want our email or our content to be written. Because if we don't train it, then we're just assuming it's going to guess. And when it guesses, just think about it. It's, it has all this knowledge from the internet. It means it can write like a five-year-old and it can write like a, a PhD. 
asking. But if I don't tell it how I want it to write, it's going to just take and assume one of those. And so this right here is probably the number one mi misconception. Now, I can edit it as I go. I can come back and say, hey, from now on, refer to this as this. And, you know, don't ever, don't use third person, use first person, that kind of stuff. I can say, use this tone throughout the rest of this content. Right now, it is that tone or that backstory is conversation by conversation. What that means is that if you open up a new conversation, you're going to have to feed it a backstory again. And so that's, and that's not a big deal. Save it in Word, save it. I, I have all this stuff saved over in my, my notes app. And so I will save the different backstories for my company when I'm writing about accounting uh, and helping accounting firms versus helping real estate people. Each time I'm going to go and plug in, let me go and find another one of these and you'll see a similar story um, where I'm feeding it a backstory of information, small business, um, here's one right here that I was writing, go up to the top and you're going to see I'm fairly methodical in how I go about doing this stuff. Look, if I just said why write an article about why small businesses struggle, it's going to use its own concepts. If I instead feed it, hi, my name's Ryan Kohler. I work for African Pro. We help small businesses create a culture to drive their talent engine. It includes this type of information, right? So you can see I'm feeding it my backstory and my vocabulary and my words, which means that now I can jump in here at any time and I can say, um, write a witty article about small businesses needing to grow their own talent. Now it's going to write some content that's going to sound down here at the bottom, that's going to sound more like me because it's using all the information above. Now, if I wanted to be to do a little bit more research, I'm going to show you this trick right here. So if I switch this right here, it's going to run a Google search. It can pull in as many results as I want. I can go back as far as I want for the past year in the United States, whatever the case may be. So I might put research on restaurants struggling to hire, right? And so it's basically going to go and pull a Google search and pull that information into our chat stream. That means that this data is now sitting in here. Think about it like I just introduced 10 responses into the conversation. Then it's going to restate it for me. So by pulling that information into the conversation, it means I just made it a little bit smarter. It's, again, it's kind of like if I had said, dear assistant, before you help me write this article, I want you to go out and run some searches in Google and do some research and come back to me with some data. Only this is way faster than that. And so I could go ahead and I could do um, research biggest pains restaurants. And so I could just let it go and pull a bunch of research. In fact, nearly half of restaurants are having trouble hiring and retaining employees, right? So now I've got all that information I can now turn this off and, and go back to just using the content that's above. At this point, I could do something like write, come up with five witty articles talking about the struggle Right. And so I need to be specific article titles. Right. So I start, I don't ask it to do the whole thing all in one shot. Right. I'm just asking it to do one thing. In this instance, it's writing an article. Now you might say, I don't write articles. Trust me, emails are just like articles. Um, one of the catches here is I use articles and books, even though I'm not always writing books. And here's my reason why I tend to write blog posts that are very educational, not salesy. If I say write a marketing piece or write a sales email or write a sales letter, it's going to think about the way the world, the internet views sales letters, they're salesy. And so I very, very rarely use the words marketing or sales inside of my prompts because it can get very aggressively marketing and marketing or sales. Instead, I'll use concepts like articles and books because I am educational in the way I approach my content. 
And so because of that, here's five witty articles. Now, clearly at this point, I could go ahead and say, write the article and it will write the article for me. Now understand that was a pretty vague prompt. I didn't tell it what tone of voice to use. I didn't tell it what my goal was. I didn't tell it what framework to follow. I just said, write an article. And so it's going to do whatever it's going to do based off of that. Now, this information is pretty good information, right? Um, but, but it's really not the way I would write it. And so instead, I would want to give it more information. I could just edit by saying, can you change this to make it more um, conversational and casual in tone? Now it's going to rewrite that same article, only it's toning it down. It's making it more conversational. This is how I tend to write, right? Um, and then we can continue. To, so now I can just say, write the full article um, as a casual conversational piece. Now it'll write the entire thing, right? Again, you just see the tone just changed. It's because I fed it that tone. I told it that that's how I wanted it to write information. And so because of that, there's a lot of ways that you can use this. One of the ways you can use it would be to rewrite something. So I'm actually going to find something. This is one that um, my sister gave me. And I was at Costco on my phone when I was writing this. And I'll show you just kind of the, the link that you can go with this thing. Um, so. As a good example, imagine that you get um, a huge market report that is very, very scientific, very dry, et cetera. Here is my prompt. Could you summarize the following commodity report to make it easier to understand for a middle school kid? Okay. That was something. And then I pasted in this entire thing and it spit back out something a little bit easier to read, right? I could say, summarize this report. I could have rewrite the following report to be more compelling, make it more exciting to read, um, right? And so it comes back with making it more compelling, more engaging. I could say to make it witty. I could ask it, write a list of questions to use this with, with this report to help the reader dig deeper into how it will impact wholesale food business, right? I'm telling it to come up with the list of questions that people should ask. Now, these are all open-ended questions. And at this point, I could say, turn it into a multiple choice question uh, uh, quiz, and it would turn it into multiple choice. But you can see clearly this is right here. And, and this is funny. So this is why I'm using this example. Um, the most important thing you can do with, with a piece of technology like this is play with it. It's to really understand it. It's how I learn about things and how I get good at things is I go mess around with it. And that means half the time, I'm not going to be very serious. I'm just literally going to push it out and see what it does and how it reacts. I can tell you, I started using ChatGPT, gosh, I think three months ago, um, I went to Cancun on vacation, ChatGPT came with me and I spent a week at the pool, just throwing stuff at it to see how it worked, to massage it, to see what it would take to get it to sound like me. So here, rewrite this as a limerick, right? Uh, rewrite this like it's from an email written by Happy Gilmore. Rewrite it like Snoop Dogg wrote it, right? Again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out and craft my own prompts. I'm trying to figure out what it takes to get it to sound the way I want it to sound. And when you think about this being an assistant, that means it's only going to be as good as my ability to use it. If, if somebody tells you that ChatGPT isn't very good, then it means they aren't very good using it. I just want to restate that. If ChatGPT isn't very good, it's like, it's like an account saying that Excel isn't very good. Well, clearly that's because they're not very good at using Excel because Excel is extremely powerful in the hands of somebody who's powerful with Excel. But in the hands of just some random stranger off the street, Excel is not very powerful. Because the power of a tool is both the potential power of the tool times the ability of the user to use it. And that right there is the most important takeaway from this entire thing tonight. 
it's your job to level up your ability to use something like this. Um, I've always found Jarvis very helpful in outlining a lengthy article, or blog post, newsletter. Yeah. So same way. So Jim has used Jarvis. Jarvis, I believe, runs on uh, ChatGPT. What Jarvis is, is a prompting engine, meaning if Jarvis, I actually know the creators of it. It used to be Jarvis. Now it's Jasper. It's a great tool. It's more expensive than ChatGPT. It was designed mostly for marketers to write content, writing blog posts and books and articles. Therefore, they built in all these different prompts and these different tools to use with it. So the main difference between Jarvis and ChatGPT as of today is that Jarvis or Jasper, they had to change their name because of Iron Man. Um, Jasper gives you some prompts to use, whereas ChatGPT, you start with an open text box. And so if I wanted to outline an article, I'm going to show you kind of the way I would go about doing it. Um, so if I come back up here and let me go find the one I was using a minute ago, um, I think there was a small business one where I was talking about restaurants. Oh, wait, it was right there. Small business employee recruiting. All right. So here is here is the uh, conversational piece I was writing. So I could say, um, come up with five article titles um, about restaurants struggling to recruit. Right now, it's going to come back with what these articles are. Now, I could take and say, let's outline the article. So now it's going to give me an outline. Now, let me stop right here and explain once again the use of the word outline. I didn't tell it how I wanted the article to flow. So just think about that for a minute. How many different ways are there to outline an article? So there's a lot is the answer. There are proven ones. And so one question to ask it would be, what are the most common um, writing blog article um, structures and frameworks? So I can ask ChatGPT to go ahead and review this for me. Now you can see there's a bunch of different ways to outline an article, right? I can also say, what are some of the most marketing writing frameworks? Now, there's a reason why I'm asking this. That's going to choke on us here. Hang on a second. See, even this, sometimes it gets a little slow. There's a whole bunch of people in it all at the same time. Sometimes you have to refresh it to get it to fire back up here. Trust me, it's still better than, than not using this. Um, let me go back and find my thing. Sorry. Here we go, small business employees. All right, so I'm gonna come back in here and I'm going to go back to it writing us some articles. So it lets, I'm gonna use a book as my example here. And so I could say, come up with five witty book titles. Now, if I just had come up with five book, witty book titles, let me give you a good example. It's just gonna come up with all kinds of stuff, right? Because again, that was a very vague question. It talks about napping. It talks about procrastination. Clearly, I asked it a vague question. So in this instance, I need to go and say, come up with five booty book titles um, focused on restaurants who are struggling to hire and how they need to use recruitment marketing. Okay, so right here, you can see here that I'm feeding it my hypothesis. I'm feeding it what I believe is what they should do, right? I, I believe that restaurants should start using apps like Starbucks app for ordering and don't have their customers order with a real life person. That's what I believe is the way to solve it. And so by feeding it my hypothesis, it can come in here and do it. So what would I do with this? Well, at this point, Sorry, I got too much stuff on my screen. Uh, so at this point, I could say, you know, come up with uh, 12 witty chapter titles to outline the book 
and it'll outline this book for me, right? So it's now going to spit back the outline. So here it's broken up into these 12 chapters. I could also say outline the chapters for the book. Now, clearly if I was writing fiction, I might want to change what I'm asking for. It, it's teed up to write it a certain way, right? And so this is feeding this back. Now, when I before, before we got off base, I got off base. Um, I'll show you. I'm just going to walk you through how I come up with content. I tend to use chapters of a book, and then I'm going to switch these over to be blog titles. And so I would actually tell it to come up with three or five, three to five blog titles for each chapter. But once I have an actual title, like this right here, measuring the ROI recruitment tactics, I can once again say, write the chapter, and it's going to give me a chapter using whatever flow and framework it wants to use. But there are other frameworks to follow. One of them is called PAS, it's Pain Agitate Solution. And so I could instead say, write, the following chapter in a witty and um, compelling tone following the PAS framework now is going to adjust the way that it goes about writing it. It's now going to use problem, agitate, solution, right? It's going to run in a different mode or a different way. I might instead say, write this chapter following the hero framework, which is more of a fictional, right? We have a hero, it's, they're going on a journey. Um, and so sometimes it does it the right way. This is thinking the hero framework is spelled out. For me, most of the time, I actually dictate the framework. And so when I'm writing a piece of content, I will actually tell it, follow the why, what, how, now framework, and it will then follow that flow. So if you're a writer and have to write content, you just need to go in and play with this and get your own kind of flow, feed it your tone, know what to ask for. I give it my own framework and, and basically I'm telling it what headings to use. But let me show you some other ways that we can use this um, in real life. And so hang on a second, I'm going to go and grab, for instance, if somebody gave me this article and wanted me to sum it up, I could literally say, summarize the following article by breaking it down into a bullet list. And I can plug it in, and it's going to break it into a bullet list. I could also write somebody an email, and this is where I think a lot of people aren't seeing the true value of how this works. So I'm going to jump over to my inbox. Um, somebody, somebody wasn't very pleased. This email that I sent out, this came from ChatGBT. And if you know me, which my employees know me, they probably knew it was because it had uh, emojis. And I don't generally use emojis in my writing, but I was going fast. I told ChatGBT to write this email and it wrote it. Somebody wrote back and said, they'll never use AI because they believe anyone's a fraud. I wanted to respond to this person. Um, and so I basically just took their information and said, copy this, jump back over into chat GBT and said, can you write a response to this email? Now, clearly I didn't feed it any context, right? I didn't feed it the backstory. So if I wanted to give it more backstory, I could say, I could feed it this. I could say, I wrote someone this email to invite them to my webinar. Now it's rewriting the answer and they responded with this. So now I'm going to get the response back. And it's going to write the, the email to go back to them. Now, I might take this and say, can you write this in a more casual um, tone? 
and it will rewrite it for me. See how we just switched? I totally get if you're not into using chat GPT, it's not for everyone, but just to clarify, blah, 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 right? And so I can use this kind of setup. Look, it's even because I fed it my previous email I wrote, it knows where the webinar uh, subscription thing is at. So I can actually use this to write the replies. I might say, um, create a sequence of emails to follow up with people who attended my webinar. This is what I need to do with all of you guys. You all came to my webinar today. I need to come up with a sequence of emails to follow up. Now, here once again is the point. I asked for a sequence of emails for people. I didn't tell it what my goal was. So it's going to write a series of emails for me. Thanks for attending. Here's a recap and the key takeaways, um, how to take your skills for the next level. But it's clearly not going to have a call to action or tell them to do something because I didn't tell it that I wanted one. And so in this instance, once again, it did write a sequence of emails, but it's not exactly what I wanted to do. So imagine if instead I said, uh, write a sequence of emails targeted towards office managers and admin assistants. So again, now I've told it who we're targeting, right? Who attended the chat GBT webinar. So these are attendees, not the ones that didn't come, right? Um, I just want the subjects. Targeted towards office managers and assistants who attended the chat GBT webinar um, with the goal being to invite them to download our office manager prompt sheet. I don't even have that set up, but I'm going to show you that that's what I could do. I, if, if my call to action at the end of the webinar was download my prompts for office managers to make it easier to use, I need to tell it that that's what I'm trying to do. And I, I hope what, like most likely when you see this, this, this presentation today, I get one of two things that people walk away with. Number one, they walk away saying, oh my gosh, like that takes a lot more work than I thought it would. Yeah, if you want the content to be good, it takes work because opportunities and these things, they look like work. It's not something simple. If you want it to give you good results, you're gonna have to put good stuff into it and learn to work it. On the other hand, you should see that this sounds a lot more human than it did to begin with. And, and the reason why it's sounding more human is because I'm feeding it the same way I would feed or engage with another human. At this point, I could do a lot of stuff. I might want to come up with, um, write out the top 20 prompts to use by office managers in chat GBT to help them with office work at a SaaS company. Again, very specific, right? So it's going to come up with some prompts to use. Literally, it just wrote for me what I could send out as the follow-up, right? Can you provide me with a list of upcoming trade shows we're attending? What are the current sales? So some of this stuff it may not have. What is the status of the new? So here's the problem with these prompts right here. These prompts are prompts that I would have to go record somebody talking in order for me to use that knowledge to create a new email, right? What is the procedure for uh, submitting expense reports? The problem is going to be that it doesn't know because that procedure, I would need to instead come in here and say, write me an example procedure. See, it doesn't know what mine is. And so I could say to write an example procedure for it, right? And it would go ahead and write me this procedure. I could also take and copy and paste in one of my other ones, one that we already have, and say, rewrite this, but make it shorter, but make it, you know, change out the word. The, you know, whatever it is that you want, you could look at this and say, rewrite it. I don't want it going to the accounting department, but 
You see the difference here between just telling it one of these prompts, what's the protocol? So this is a good example. These prompts wouldn't work unless you were feeding it the library of your rules and policies and procedures to pull from. But I could actually do that. Um, and so hopefully this makes sense. I, I'm gonna open it up. If anybody's got any questions, hopefully we've, I've still got you here and you're not like completely glazed over. Um, depending on the which you do for your job, then clearly you would have to tweak this until you get to that point. What I find for a lot of things is um, I tend to want to reply back to an email in a very short way. So I'm going to go find, let me go find an email that somebody wrote me. Look, seven reasons you're not building muscle. Here you go. So um, this person wrote me an email. And so I could clearly um, come back in here into chat GPT and I could say, open a new chat, say, I'm write a reply to this email telling them that I'm not interested. This is going to write a much nicer e email than it would have if I just said, I'm not interested. See how much faster that was than me actually just writing the whole email out. Um, I could take, because this isn't long enough, and I could say, expand the above email to be three paragraphs long. Right. So this is going to expand that context to make it more. Uh, I could say, write it more professional, like a lawyer would. Now it's going to level up the words, right? It's using correspondence regarding whatever. Um, and so this is expanding it out and changing the context. Now, right here's a good example. I wanted it to change the tone like a lawyer. It wrote it like it was a lawyer. So right there is a good example of, you know, our prompts matter. I, I should have changed the tone and said, no, I'm not a lawyer. I just want to use the tone and complex um, vocabulary of a lawyer. Now it's going to rewrite it. I'm no longer a lawyer, but I'm using big giant words, right? I could also write right, this like I'm a six year old and it will tone it down, right? And so all of those things, again, I'm just tweaking the tone. I'm still not changing the actual, con I didn't feed it new context. I didn't feed it new information. And I didn't change my suggestion of what I wanted to do other than say, I'm not interested, right? If I wanted this to do something different, then I would need to tell it to do something different. Um, so there's a whole lot of different things. If The way to think about it is, and this is where it's weird, think about what you do at work, the words, the terminology. So for instance, what I do at work, um, I sometimes build product uh, roadmaps and user stories. I need to know, do you understand agile user stories used in product development of software? Yep, I understand it. Excellent. Once I know that it understands it, I can now take and feed it a user story. There's two ways to do it. I could copy and paste one of my own user stories and say, this is my structure for my user stories. Please use it as we write new user stories. Or I can just let it run its own thing. But again, if I just said write a user story for a new feature that we are building to help restaurants uh, manage their team switching schedules, this is going to write a user story. It's not going to be perfect. The reason it's not going to be perfect because I didn't actually tell it what the tool does. So you can see here the limitations once again of this is the limitations of what I'm feeding it. The fact is there's as many ways to write a user story for software uh, as there are product managers. And because of that, it has to guess what user story I want it to use. I'm better off now, think about it this way. I could say um, research structure of user stories for SaaS 
Tech's tech companies focused on small businesses. Now it's going to hit Google. It's going to pull back this information. I can proof it. And then I can use that to create my framework. So now I can say, create a framework to use when writing user stories for my product. And now it's going to spit one out for me. Now at this point, this is now what is going to follow. I could give it a name, call this Ryan's user story. And then in the future, I could say, use Ryan's user story to write a user blah, blah, blah for uh, an HVAC company who's doing whatever. And so this gives us the ability to create a framework. And so this right here is what I call framework. In this instance, it created a framework from the information that we pulled from the internet. I could have it blend this together. So I could actually take this and say, blend um, this user story with the growth hacking um, concepts in a more simplified way and make it blend together more. And so this really is kind of one of the powers for how to use it is it's as powerful as I am. Now you might look at this and say, um, I, I don't know how anybody who does any writing, any correspondence, any emails, anything for marketing teams or sales teams or any, any in there um, doesn't see the power of using this. It effectively lets me write a few sentences, right? Write an email to my boss um, telling him that I'd like to have a meeting to discuss this new project about restaurants and hiring, and it will write me a much longer one, right? Just that alone would make it so that you won't get in trouble for using two and three line uh, emails because you've expanded it. Now I could actually put together though a proposal if I actually fed the information. And in this instance, it's where it goes back to the backstory thing. I need to use Otter to give it information. If I want it to be precise, then I have to be precise, not just with my prompt, with my request, but also with the stuff I fed it. So you can see in my chat GBT, this is kind of outrageous. And I've got all kinds of different conversations that I'll actually refer back to. If I want to do something about the, the notice that there's a shower, sour cream shortage, well, then I'm going to do that to write a notice. So there's a sour cream shortage. I would come back to this and use it in the future. I could also use this to write a witty article about why air fryers are the best clients for older couples to make steak. Again, you can see this prompt gives me back a decent article, but because I didn't feed it any context above this, it doesn't have anything else to work with other than its own thinking and reasoning of the internet. And that's probably... The biggest difference that hopefully you walk away from this, you're going to get out of AI what you put into it. And more specifically, you're going to get out of an employee what you put into them. If you invest in an employee, you invest in a relationship, you invest in teaching them and giving them context. Well, then when you make a request, you're going to get back from them what you expected. And in the same way, that's the best way to think about chat GBT as we're using this. You're going to get back from it what you expected. Um, and or what you put into it. And therefore, if you're not getting back what you want, then you need to level up the information you're putting in and the prompts that you're asking from it. So I'm going to open up to questions here just in the last little bit. I know that we're, we're kind of over our hour long allotment here. Um, I know that Jim, it looks like probably writes more marketing type content. I know that we had some people on here who, um, Jim head honcho of JM content, right? So he's a content person. I know, you know, a category manager or an account manager, an executive assistant, Kathy, if you're, if you're looking at something like that, you could take and say, what are some of the best uses? This is probably where I'd start um, of chat GBT for executive. Now, if you were to just ask that one, the key here is, I was, again, vague. Executive assistance is a vague term, but it's going to give me 
some different ideas of what I could use it for. Translation, writing and editing. Now, if I was more specific, I would say, my name is Kathy. I'm an executive assistant for a small SaaS company. Um, we help you know, employers hire. We build a product that does X, Y, and Z. I'm currently the executive assistant for the VP of sales. Our sales team is focused on blah, 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 blah. And you see, I'm feeding it more context so it knows because an executive assistant could be an executive assistant for a product person, a manufacturing person, an accountant. You see, by me keeping it vague, it's going to give me back vague answers. And I might look at this and say, well, I, I don't do translation. Like that's that's not part of my job. And, and that may make it easy to dismiss it. But in actuality, the reason why you're dismissing it is because you fed it vagueness. And so that really is kind of the core concept here um, is feed it good stuff. Going back to our little chart here. Um, if you give it your story, if you tell it your target, if you explain it, your goal, what you're trying to accomplish, and then if you feed it context, make sure that you're not expecting it to know something you didn't tell it. In the same way, I wouldn't expect my employees to know something I didn't tell them. But if we check off these first four, this is like the superpower behind writing content that sounds like you wrote it. If you just buy somebody's prompt, throw it in there, and then you complain that the content comes back isn't very good, I can tell you almost every single time it's going to be you tried to short circuit the process. You might look at this and say, well, if I'm going to have to do all of this work, I may as well write it myself. The answer is you're not going to save time maybe on the first thing. You're going to save time on the second thing. Yeah, AI is rapidly becoming a prime specialty for that fast growing virtual assistant industry. You're right, Jim, because to be honest, like I've had a virtual assistant and for a lot of the things I might ask it to do, ChatGPT might be faster for me to just use. On the other hand, if I had a virtual assistant, here's what I would do. And this will give you a good explanation for how I would use it with my employees. What I would do if I had a virtual assistant or an employee or somebody reported me is I would actually take and build the backstories for them. Does that make sense? Like I would actually take and record when I ask you about subject A, I want you to feed this backstory to it. Hi, my name's Ryan. I work for Applicant Pro. I am doing X, Y, and Z. My focus is blah. I do this. When I ask you to do something in this world, feed it this backstory. And so if I was working with a virtual assistant or honestly an assistant at all or anybody, if I was trying to scale my team's ability, if you're the person who has all the knowledge trapped in their head and you have salespeople or support people or whatever the case may be, showing them not just chat GPT, but giving them the backstory to train their own models with and giving them the prompts you would use will get you back the same type of content that you would have created. But if you just ask your employees to go check out chat GBT and you don't feed the backstory to them and you don't show them the way that you would use it, then they're going to use it their own way. But you're right. Like I believe the article I was reading today says AI will, will be as big, as significant of a change as the internet. Um, and, and my guess is, it's probably true. This, this is a major like leap forward. Does that mean we're there right now? No. It, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean we're there right now at all. But what I believe using this structure that I taught tonight will let you do is free up some time. So the key to be healthy balance between ambiguity and strategic yet effective application request. Yeah. So for me, that is to find the balance of I feed it my knowledge and then I ask specific requests if I know that that's what I'm trying to accomplish. It's very much it's it's having the framework. If I want a specific outcome, then I feed it specific information. If I want a vague outcome, then I can feed it vague information, but I almost never want a vague outcome, right? That, so yes, that's number one. Number two would be to create a string based on a subject. So if I have a subject such as AI's impact on office admins, I'm going to use this and continue to dig deeper. So I might do some research at the top about AI's impact on office managers, then I'm going to come down and feed it my own kind of, I believe it will do X, Y, and Z. I think office managers should approach it using this framework. Then I'm going to drill down and have it start writing a book for me. I might have it write some articles. I might have it outline a PowerPoint presentation to teach people how to use it. But I'm just going deeper after I've nailed down the subject matter at the top. 
But if I try to short circuit that, and I think I'm going to jump in and just work on it from day one with just a prompt and just borrow somebody else's stuff, then I'm probably not going to be happy with the result. Um, and, and so that is really, you know, healthy balance. The, the best way to think about it is you're partnering with this tool in the same way you partnered with Excel. I know a lot of people that on their resume say they know how to use Excel and they learned how to use Excel in a high school class or college class. And I can tell you that their usage of Excel is very different than my ability to use Excel after using it for the last 20 years in different situations. That right there, Excel is equally powerful in both of our hands as far as its potential. But because I use it in a different way and I've, I've built up the muscle of using it, it becomes more powerful overall when I use it versus somebody fresh out of school. And so that really is, if, if you do anything this weekend or, or this week, just play with it. Um, yeah, no, yeah, it might actually help you understand how to write a proposal or thesis. Yeah, I've written entire proposals off of this. Um, again, I feed it the information I want. I want to create a proposal on X. It will definitely help you outline uh, proposals and thesis. Um, it will write an entire contract. Again, though, if I say, write me a contract without feeding it information first, then it's not going to do the greatest for me. Um, yeah, that this right here, I think Jim nailed it and nailed the way I use it. Copywriters are among the highest paid in the business. So I spend the majority of my time creating content. AI could easily not replace me, quadruple the output. That's the way to think about this. This is the way I think about it. It's not, oh my gosh, one day AI is going to take my job because whether it does or doesn't, I, it's not in my control. But that right there, it can make me four times faster at getting to the same output means that I can, I don't know, have more time to not be doing that job. Have more time to not be doing those things and do something else. As somebody who works a lot of hours, it means I can work less hours. It also means where I used to need quiet um, because I was trying to work inside my brain to come up with ideas, I can brainstorm with it on my phone while I'm sitting, you know, at a soccer game. And I wouldn't have been able to do that previously when it was just me needing quiet time. And so that's really the way to think about it is I I've spent a ton of time just chatting back and forth. You can see I've got all a whole range of content and topics from, you know, catchy phrases to go on t-shirts and everything in between. But that right there is the exact kind of way to think about it is it's as powerful as you are at being good at using it. Um, yes, Carrie, it's time for you to play with it so that you can get better with it. Um, but, the, but that work-life balance is why I'm teaching uh, what I was teaching tonight. Like if, if all you did was download ChatGPT or get an account on ChatGPT, go figure out how to use it to write five emails this week, it might save you an hour. If all you did was took and fed it the email you wrote and simply said, rewrite this for me, but more professional, rewrite this for me or, or summarize it for me. Or if you used it to just grab a blog post and summarize that to send to your team, if that's all you used it for this week, it'll save you more time than you spent with me today. And that was my goal. So if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Um, I'll throw my email right here in the chat, ryan at refer.io, or you can reply to any emails you got from me. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear your questions. We're going to be doing a whole series on these. And so most likely doing it for different roles and different jobs. I've already done one for HR people, but most likely we'll do one for sales and marketing because once you drill down into that individual level, um, into a specific role, um, then I can actually give you the prompts and show you how I would use it in your own job. So if you have something like that, you'd like help on, shoot me an email. Otherwise, thanks so much for coming tonight. We'll talk to you guys later.